Thank you. I had to stop making photos like this <laughs> because apparently in Central and South America, this means your wife's cheating on you. <laughs> Why they have a hand signal to indicate this? I mean, is this kind of a, so common that we need a signal? I don't know. No, I mean, literally, uh, I, I had to quit doing that. Okay. Well, anyway, hey, uh, let's see how I'm going to do this. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about uh, parsing tonight. I like nothing more than talking about programming and uh, parsing grammars and that sort of stuff. Um, <coughs> so, uh, uh, people know this quote that I had years ago. It says, why program by hand in five days what you can spend five years of your life automating? I've had to make a small modification to that. It's now 25 years later, but I finally have the parser generator I was looking for. <laughs> so now I just have to remember what I was doing in graduate school in the late 80s and get back to it. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to introduce Antler 4 to you. I promise this is my last version. Uh, I, I, I have no more uh, Antler rewrites in me. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit of the big picture so we're all on the same page with regards to uh, you know, terminology and remind some of you, refresh your memory on parsing. Uh, then, one of my goals with this version of Antler was to satisfy a very common problem, which is, you're not really a language guy. How many language you know, parsing theory people we got here? <laughs> okay. okay, we got a couple of freaks in the audience. But most of us, all we want to do is, okay, you know you got to you know, parse Java or C Sharp or whatever, but you don't care how it's done. You just want to get notified when you see a variable declaration, you see uh, a method declaration, whatever. You want to divorce yourself from the grammatical difficulties and just focus on living in your comfortable Java space or whatever. So without any kind of really looking at the grammar, we're going to solve a real language problem. And then I'll, uh, as we go along, I'll show you a little bit about the new version of Antlerworks, written by Sam Harwell, my co-author of Antler 2, or Antler 4. Um, so as part of this whole attempt to make it easier to use uh, and, uh, Antler and to build language applications, I'm going to show you something about the listener and visitor mechanism that Antler can automatically build for you to help you uh, build language applications that feed off of input streams. And then we'll do a really quick comma-separated value grammar uh, just for fun. I'll show you the various tools, how that works. And then I will strut my stuff on adaptive LSR grammars and show you why that is so cool. Okay, so a couple of terms. So a language application's job is really to recognize input and to respond to that in some way. And you know, respond means either you load in a configuration file or you interpret it or you translate it, something like that. And to recognize something means to be able to identify the, it's kind of like identifying the parts of speech. Like in English, you can say that's a subject, that's a predicate, this is the object. And then, oh yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I need a little exercise though, so you know. Um, uh, so, you need to be able to identify the, the pieces of it, and you need to be able to differentiate that, like an assignment from a return statement. Okay, so that's what recognition is about. The job of the recognizer is to take in a character stream and break it up into a sequence of symbols called tokens or symbols, vocabulary words like, you know, in English. It then applies a grammatical analysis, if you will, it checks the syntax. As it does this, it doesn't just throw it away, right? Because you could read in 500 megabytes of Fortran code and go, hey, it works. Uh, but it doesn't do anything, right? A, a Boolean yield out of that is useless. So you have to do something with that. And what you want to know, again, is what are the parts of speech effectively? How do you get those pieces out of there so that you can do something with them? So you may not realize it, but uh, you know we're all so good at reading. But you remember when you first started, you were like, dog, oh, dog, you know, and then you keep going. You're looking at the characters and putting them together. And that's exactly what the human bra brain does. And that's typically what we do when we do language processing by computer. And if you look at that uh, humu, humu, nuku, nuku, pa, wah, wah, or whatever that is, um, <laughs> you realize that your brain is actually looking for that damn space. 
And so you really are still doing breaking it up. And if you look at Morse code, it's even more obvious, right? Okay. So the result of this parse, in many cases, and in most applications that we're going to care about, are uh, the result is a parse tree. And a parse tree is a representation of the input. You can see in my leaves I've got, whoop, I've got on the bottom there the input. And a little finger puppets. And, whoop, whoop. Um, it also has named the parts of speech effectively for us, right? The nodes interior to this tree are the names of the rules that were applied to match that input. So it's not only the entire input, it tells you how it was matched. If you know how it's matched, then you know how to respond to it. So on the right side there, I've got sort of a description of some of the classes used by Antler in its runtime. And the, I've tried to be as parsimonious as possible. The parse tree points into a token stream, which is the set of symbols that were broken up by the tokenizer. And then those don't copy the characters either. Those point into the original character stream. And that's cool because then when you're in this parse tree, you could go all the way back to the exact character in the input stream of where something happened. Okay? And so this is all nicely tied together with a bunch of pointers. Um, so s how many of you have played with Antler 3? So there's some work involved if you want to build a tree, right? And there's even more work if you want to walk that with a grammatical tree parser, things like that. Um, kind of a long story, but uh, I, was, um, I was asked to evaluate for the, anybody remember the, the Oracle Google Android trial? I was an expert witness for that, and they asked me to review the source code. I went in. And I was really, really surprised. I was thinking to myself, oh my god, this is going to be a mess on the inside, right? Really complicated bytecode manipulation stuff. It turns out it was really clean. And they used a visitor pattern to go through this. And normally I, I hate, I don't even like the word pattern. Because to me it's just what programmers, you know, it's experience. And then you have to have a book about it, and then, you know. Um, it's like a fad, you know, XML or whatever. Um, but, you know, they really did something nice there. I understood what was going on because I knew what they meant by a visitor pattern. And anyway, so I started thinking more about the Antler thing, and I realized that what I do is not build compilers. I don't build compilers. That's the way I started, so that's why I was thinking those kinds of trees you had. But in the end, you know, I translate, I do little interpreters, things like that. None of us build compilers. So I should modify Antler so that it focuses on what we do most of the time, which is to build these little things. And so the beauty is that now it will automatically build these trees for me automatically. You can turn it off if you want. And it will automatically generate the infrastructure, the scaffolding for listeners and visitors so that I can have it notify me when things of interest happen. Okay, so imagine you go to a new job here at Boundary and your boss says to you, I want you to read in Java code and extract an interface so it's like your refactoring pattern in Eclipse or IntelliJ. I, what it means is, you know, you flip the public and uh, then you get rid of the method bodies and all that kind of stuff, right? So this is, this is a reference from the, or an example from the, the book. So your first step <coughs> for most of you is panic, right? What are you going to do? And then you, okay, you know, your, your coffee kicks in and you realize, oh, well, you know, let's just compile this stuff, right? And then let's maybe, let's look at the bytecode output and see if we can pull out and then some of you realize, oh, hey, let's just use the Java P program, because that's going to literally print out those uh, methods for me. And then I can do a little, you know, Perl <coughs> or something like that to translate it into the right form. And then all of a sudden the boss says, oh, yeah, and by the way, keep all of the white space and comments exactly the way they are. You're like, hmm, now what? All right, we're back to step one. Panic! How do you do this? There's nothing, there's nothing for it. You have to parse that code, right? Well, let's solve that problem. So you can imagine going to a website and saying, give me a Java grammar. You don't want to build it yourself. So that means we get a Java.g4, and I have the Antler tool, and I have its runtime, so I can execute the uh, generated parsers. And then I don't care about the grammar. 
let me stay in my Java world and just, just call a function. Give me a callback when you find a method declaration. That's all I want to know about. And then, oh, you have to pass me the context. You have to tell me like, what that little piece of the tree looks like so I can print out the right stuff. Because I need to know more than just that it's a method declaration. I need to know which one. OK, so we need to know a little bit about the grammar, right? We're going to have to take a quick peek at it. But there's a, a rule called method declaration. And obviously, a method is like you know, type, identifier, formal parameters, and some junk, right? So I need to know at least those three things. Oh, I'm going to parse a whole file. So I need to know what the starting rule is in the grammar. So that's called compilation unit. And then I need to know the concept of a listener. It's like a Sachs-like thing where it just fires off these entry and exit events. So we don't even really care what the details are here. Just note that woo, you got a type, identifier, formal parameters. And then everything else we don't care about, right? Because we're trying to make an interface. OK, maybe I need the throws clause on there or something. But this is close enough. OK, so give you a quick view of whatever this is, Antlerworks. So this is a nice little thingy. You can run it, and you can generate grammars with it, and you can, it'll bring up trees. And I'll show you all that in a second. But so this is uh, based on NetBeans, so that means it's also a plug-in if you want it that way. So we've got a Java grammar. We run antler on it. And that's just a little alias for whatever the Java incantation is. And the result of that run of the antler tool is to generate the parser, the syntax analyzer, the lexer, the tokenizer, and automatically builds two things. The listener interface, which looks like this here. You note that it's got entry and exit events, method calls, for all of the grammar rules. And there's something called a base listener, which is a default or blank implementation of all of these. So if all you want to do is implement one method, you just subclass that and override the one method. Very easy. So here is the one method that we need to override. So when the parser has seen, we're actually walking the parse tree after the parse, but when we see a method declaration, This is the code that's going to get executed. And notice it passes me a particular kind of node. This happens to be a subclass of you know, parse tree node or something like that that is specific to a method declaration match because I need to get the identifier, the type, and the formal parameters out of there. So it is specially generated one context object for each rule in your grammar. And it contains everything matched by that rule. So you've got it all. You know that it was called, and you have information to get uh, all the details from the input. And then in the end, I'm just going to print it back out, right? The type, the name, and the args. Semicolon instead of the body. Done, right? So uh, we actually need a little bit of code so we can call this thing. So I'm starting out here. So this was automatically generated for me. So I say, give me a parser. Start parsing at the start rule. And there's you know, some little bit of setup here for the token stream. But the result of that is to give me the parse tree back. Then I'm saying, give me a standard. This is just a class in the library. It, it's something we'll see in a second that walks this tree for me. And then this is the, the uh, object that I just defined for you that implements the method entry uh, method declaration. And so then I tell the walker to walk the tree with that listener. And then it just fires events as it sees them. So I can compile all the crap. And then if I run this little thing on that input file, which was the demo, which I'll show you, we get the right stuff. So let's see now. OK, so I'm going to run antler on this. Uh, pardon me. Actually, and I'm even shorter than that. Uh, do I have the right version of this? Tell you what, I'm going to run uh, uh, generate recognizer. And I don't want a visitor, just a listener. And finish. 
Okay, so I've got all these things in here. This extract interface uh, tool is the code that calls the uh, calls the parser and the walker. Anyway, so I'm just going to compile all this crap. Uh, well, that would be unfortunate. I just tried this. Uh, oh, you know, I probably have, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I may not have set this uh, path up directly. Lib. Uh, oh, I'll do like a thigh master here. Get my things properly done. Now let's see. It still is coming up the wrong one. That's, uh, how's that possible? Oh, I know why. Uh, <sighs> and then in principle, everybody is happy. I compile. And, uh, okay, so now I'm going to run that extract interface tool thingy. And the file that I've got is just that little Java file, which I made J so the compiler didn't complain all the time. And you can see that the people in the front can see. That it spit out all of the stuff with all the appropriate comments in there. Because I said, you know, get the start of this, uh, uh, this method that we matched and basically print out until the end. And it got everything in between because remember it points back into the original character stream. So I know everything in between two points. Okay. Any questions so far? Comments, social commentary? Yeah. So this is the stack file parser. Um, you but you also got this parser the whole stream beforehand. Is there a thing? Yeah, it's 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 not a perfect analogy parse the entire input first. Um, you can actually put actions in the grammar still, but, uh, you know, so like, if you're parsing a network stream, okay, don't, don't make me a parse tree, and put actions directly in the grammar that are just like bang, 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 as I see stuff. So, you can be as efficient as you want to be, but for the common case where you just don't, you just don't care, this is the way to do it. So it actually builds, it's kind of a mix of a Saks DOM thing, where it actually builds the entire tree, the equivalent of the DOM tree, and then you can walk it with the visitor, or you can use the automatic listener to have it go fire the events. And the reason that you like this, uh, this, um, this intermediate form, this parse tree, is because it's often the case that you want to walk something multiple times. And my first, well, it wasn't a real job. Uh, my, my first task as a postdoc was to take this hideous Fortran 77 and turn it into parallel thinking machines Fortran. Anybody remember the thinking machines boxes? We called them blinking machines because they had nothing but a bunch of LEDs going blue. It was in uh, <laughs> Jurassic Park or whatever. So blinking <laughs> or stinking machines or whatever, you know. So uh, I had to parallelize this thing. And it was such a mess to do this that it, I had a 15 pass translator. Because each pass it was just so hard, you could only think about one thing at once. And so I gradually morphed it as I went along. Each pass did something else. And so that's why we like a tree. Otherwise, you've got to reparse it, right? But then wait a minute, if you're morphing it, what are you reading back in, right? You've got to have some tree that is a representation of this. So, okay. We've kind of already gone over this. Uh, but, so you, you got this parse tree that's built. And the standard parse tree walker is just a depth first walk, right? It goes down as it discovers a node, it fires the appropriate enter event based upon that node. So each one of these nodes gets, you know, automatically generated by antler. I should say here, here, here. And so when the tree walker sees one of these, it just hits it with a, a message to notify. And it, it fires off an enter event. After this has walked all of its children, it then fires the associated exit event, and so that's very much like a SACS thing. So you just fill in the methods as you want. So your, the list of methods that you have is really the interface to your surrounding application. 
Now, it could be something really trivial, right? You just load a bunch of properties into your application. Or it could be you're actually doing, interpreting a, a calculator language in here or a translator. But this is how the parser connects to your surrounding application. Now, it's often the case that you don't want just some brain dead parse tree walker, uh, which does the depth first walk. You don't want that to be doing your walking. You want to walk your own. For example, if, uh, if you have like, uh, if you're parsing uh, or traversing a tree that represents a program and you have something that's if false and then 30 megabytes of nodes. Well, you know, if you're trying to be efficient and you're doing flow analysis or something, you might decide, oh, well, I'm not going to walk the children because I know this damn thing is false statically, right? So there are reasons you might want to walk this thing yourself. It's also the case then if I'm doing the calls that I can return values. So if you're building a calculator, this is really easy. So I've extended the standard notion of a visitor with a type parameter that says the return value. So every method in the visitor can return whatever you want. You like, I like. It's very nice. Um, let's see here. So then, yeah, you, on your visit, you just say visit and give it the root, and it, uh, it jumps over. Okay. Let's see, how are we doing on time here, Deidre? Yeah, you're fine. All right. Usually I have an internal sense, but I've just consumed enough salt that <laughs> I think my, uh, I'm having an aneurysm or something at the moment. Oh, that's perfect, perfect. Well, you guys say that, but they may not. <laughs> They're like, look at their watches, you know what they're okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when I start to get up and leave, then you ever. <clears throat> All right, let's look at an actual, an actual grammar, a simple little grammar. We want to parse simple comma-separated values. Um, by the way, if you actually start looking at the filth that spreadsheets dump, <laughs> that stuff, that's, that's really complicated, you know? Yeah, whoever decided that like two quotes in a row is a single quote escaped should be publicly beaten. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically what I want to do is just, I just want to parse a little bit of input. You know, and that's going to come back to haunt me. I'm going to be in a trial sometime, like, you know, trying to defend myself. And they'll whip back this video. Say, oh, so Professor Parr, you're into beating uh, random humans, I see. Yes. <laughs> yes. Only if they deserve it. Uh, so I don't know if you, I guess maybe we'll try to get this font size uh, bigger. Let's see. What can we do? Maybe 24. Whoa. Okay, well, anyway, you can see, if I move this around, you can see that there are syntax diagrams and all that are automatically put in here, but we don't care about that. Oh, this is small enough. Yeah, we, we got it. Okay. So, just to identify the elements here. Uh, the rules that start with a capital letter are lexical rules. Uh, an artifact of uh, Yak from 30 years ago. Um, and the parser rules start with a lowercase letter. So I've defined white space. You'll note, you version three people, that I've done the set notation, thankfully. And also, there's no action here in a random language. It's now understood that all of the common actions you want a lecturer to do, we can do it in a language-independent fashion. Right? So my goal is to get actions out of the grammar so that not only is it application-independent, it's language-independent. So I can take the same Java grammar and generate a parser for it in Python, C, C Sharp, whatever. Okay, and the way to do that is to keep all of the actions out of there. So this just says throw that crap out. This uh, is a greedy operator, non-greedy operator to match anything between here. It basically says while not quote match a string, um, an identifier, and so here's my start rule. Just by definition, I put it at the top, and I'm going to match a bunch of records, and a record is a field. Optionally with zero comma field, whatever, and then I have um, a new line on the end. Or nobody will admit it, but if you're a Windows programmer, then you'll have character turn in line. Um, so, and my fields are very simple. I just got int and string. All right, what can we do with this damn thing? What can we do with this thing? Oh, right. <coughs> uh, well, we could do a couple things. 
Um, first thing I'm going to do is run it in the test rig. Maybe that's the only thing I'm going to do. Uh, let's see, input.csv, what does that look like? Yeah. The look of the, the like 20 year olds in, in my class when I open up this terminal thing, they're like, what is that? <laughs> and then my class is like, what the hell is that? He's typing in there and stuff is happening. I sent, a student at SS, I, I, I sent a student an SSH command the other day to get into one of my Amazon boxes. This person writes back and says, it's asking me for a credit card. <laughs> and I said, that's interesting. SSH has never asked me for a credit card. <laughs> and it turns out that they were putting this SSH command to connect to the remote server into the browser URL window. That was awesome. It was totally awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But <clears throat> you know, it is weird. I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to teach my students that, yeah, you know, you just you're just not going to launch a server by hitting run in Eclipse, right? Yes, sometimes you have to look through a little hole um, across the net to a server. Uh, but anyway, okay. So we've got a bunch of this. Um, uh, data, and so I'm telling it to read that in, and I'm going to tell it to print out a bunch of crap. And so this gives me a parse tree. So the overall thing is a file, and then I have multiple records, and each file there's multiple fields. And I paid some really smart German guy to implement this algorithm made by an even smarter German guy <laughs> to do uh, optimal tree layout. and uh, so it's, it's much more compact than, well, this one's not as obvious, but um, it does a really good job if you have a complicated tree. So, yeah? Um, is there a way to optimize this so that it will actually take advantage of vertical space instead of? Uh, not mine, no. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> one could imagine, one could imagine a way to do that. Uh, but uh, I said he was smart, I didn't say he was Einstein. No. <laughs> So, and, and this also prints out, uh, you can see I told it to print out all the tokens, so it shows me, you know, what index of the token, the character positions, the string, the token type, uh, oh no, that's the index, the character indexes, and that's the line and uh, character position. And then I told it to print out the tree in list format. So you can get all kinds of stuff from this thing, and there's this command line tool, see if it actually is a, it's around, yes it is. Um, you can say basically, so let's see, what do I got? I got this grammar thingy here. CSV.g4 built all this stuff you see sitting here. And so now, just by compiling it, I don't have any main program or anything. I can say grun the CSV grammar starting at rule file match input.csv. Uh, <laughs> one more time. Let's see. Okay, let's see what happens. Uh, let's see, it's probably grun alias again. <sighs> I can fix that. You'd think I would have tried this earlier. Uh, I think that is going to be okay. grun. <laughs> ah, yeah, here we go. Okay, that doesn't do anything because I didn't tell it to do anything. But I didn't get any syntax here. So then I can say, print out the tokens, and he gives me that. I can say, print out the tree, and it gives me that. And I can say, show me the German guy tree. And there it is. <laughs> and so th there's lots of, lots of stuff. Yeah? Um, can you go back to the data? Sure. What is w, how is WSD? Is that a special? No, it's, uh, I could make it anything I want. Okay. The, you don't actually, uh, you don't refer to that. I never refer to it. That's right, because what happens is, all of these lexical rules, they're kind of special. What happens is, the lexer says, okay, I've got a whole bunch of rules. Figure out which one matches at the current moment. And if it sees a white space, it goes, hey, I matched a white space. And then it just throws it away. Now, you, what if you had a rule that was like, 
white space followed by some stuff. Well, both are then, uh, what's the right word? Uh, it speculates that both might match, and then it finds that one will match more characters, so it'll match the longest pattern. So if you had white space followed by, uh, you know, um, a bang or something like that, like, you know, Python needs white space to be meaningful and so on. So there are reasons why you might actually not tell it to skip white space and so on. But yeah, it's just a bunch of rules that end up getting matched and then sent to the parser. Ah, good question. So how does it know that this rule isn't just global anytime you see it ever? So what happens is, imagine that there's like uh, a, a big decision that happens when you say, give me the next word in the input. And then it starts into a rule. But once it gets into a rule, it follows only the grammatical structure within that rule. So I could put, you know, find white space here. I could do anything I want in here. And this is not affected. So, um, and then, I don't know if it's working in this thing, but Sam has this, select an input file, uh, okay. Uh, I don't really want to see that, did I? Uh, I want to see, Oh, wait, yeah, this is what I want to see. Okay, so there is the input, and where is my, huh. Okay, so this is a little tokenizer debugger thingy that Sam has put together. Um, and so it shows you all the tokens and, and, you know, how they were matched, and then it can tell you where that token was matched in here, and, you know. So that, that's... Something you don't always need, but if you've got a really complicated lexer for like a wiki, which are just super filthy, kind of, you know, horrible stuff like, oh yeah, star means bold, unless it doesn't. <laughs> Four times five ain't bold, man, right? But you still gotta match it. So uh, that, that's when that'll come into play. Okay, meanwhile, back at our little talk here. La, 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 la. Oh, yeah. So if you wanted to use the parse tree visitor thingy, here's, if you wanted to, every time it entered one of those records, one of the lines, it could, it could give you the parse tree node associated with that, and then you could pull all the fields out of that and add it to some list if you wanted. So another example of a listener. Um, visitor, no point going through that. Okay. So what is all this adaptive LL star crap? So the previous version of Antler looked at your grammar and tried to figure out how it was going to make decisions. So imagine, I mean, when we just have a grammar, it shows you all the possible ways something could, well, it shows you all of the possible sentences in a language. But now when we have to implement a parser, we put restrictions on the grammar so that it actually fits that model of our world, right? So you have the top-down parsers and the bottom-up parsers. You have yaks, LLR1, and all these little parameters mean something, and LLK. All these things mean we cannot handle all grammars. So then people came up with things like uh, the early parser and Tamita's parser, this GLR you may have heard of. It takes any grammar you give it, but it can be quite slow. And you can't, you can't debug it, right? You can't, it gives you a bunch of integers in a table multiple tables. It's a very complicated thing, whereas everybody gets recursive descent. We all had to build one in undergrad or whatever. We all know how to build a little parser. And so that's exactly what adaptive LSR is. It's exactly what you build by hand, except it's not L01, meaning it doesn't say switch on token type, and that's how I make decisions. And a decision is like, you're an expression. Is it an integer, or is it a string? Or is it a, uh, you know, parenthesized expression? You're making a decision every time you have alternatives, right? It's like you're in a maze, and you come to a fork in the maze. Your goal is to find a path to the exit. So if you only have k symbols of look ahead, you can only look so far down this path and this one to make a decision about which way to go. What LL star does is it just says, oh, the hell with it. Pretend we have little subparsers, and we're going to let them race off and figure out which alternative path through the maze 
is eventually going to win. It's like you're going to the movies with your little brother. And there's two really long lines. You can't really see which line is for which. One of them is for Borat. High five. And the other one is for the bodyguard. I don't know about you, but I'm not seeing the bodyguard. I'm going to go to Borat. And I definitely don't want to get in the wrong line, right? So what you do is you send your little brother racing ahead and figure out what's actually at the end of the line. Now, of course, you've got to be efficient. So what you do is you remember, ah, oh, yeah, the next time I come here, the left line is Borat. Very nice. Oh, wow, wow, right? So <laughs> that, that's really efficient. You know, just get in the left line. You don't have to do that again, OK? So it is exactly what you would expect of a top-down parser generator, except it has this magic function that says, do what I need you to do right now. Um, so we have to mimic backtracking without actually having the problems, right? Here is a problem that if Antler 3 were forced to backtrack across this, or if you've used a peg before, it basically says, choose the first alternative that matches. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say, choose the path that eventually leads to the exit of the maze. In other words, choose the path that actually matches all the input. I said, choose the alternative that matches the current input. So when it finishes here, it says, oh, hey, I found an identifier, uh, identifier done. It doesn't match, excuse me, it doesn't match all the way to the end. So this is dead code. So if your input is like x plus plus, this will never match in a peg. And if Antler were forced to backtrack in this situation, that's also what it would do. So that really pisses me off. So don't worry about how, but basically it does an initial race ahead as far as it needs to only, and then records what it found so that the next time it comes through, it can immediately make a decision without any kind of complexity. And so once this warms up, it's kind of like a JIT, right? Once it warms up, a just in time compiler, it's, it turns out that the new version of Antler, at least on like the Java grammar, is faster than the old one by a little bit. And we have an experimental version that Sam built that you can't read the code, but God damn, is it fast. <laughs> uh, so that's why I kept my version that I can read, you know? Uh, but his is actually just crushingly fast. Um, so now it takes a little bit to warm up, but once it does, you know, like you, you could even train a compiler, for example, on, you know, 500 gigabytes of Java code and then serialize the internal data structures in the generated parser. Um, it's a possibility. But anyway, okay. So the cool thing is it always gets the right answer. You can give it any damn grammar you want. And as we'll see in a second, um, it can even take left recursive. I take it you all know the honey badger? Honey badger takes what it wants, it doesn't give a damn. All right? That has is, that is got to be the world's best video. You owe it to yourself to take a picture of that URL and take that home and try that out. Uh, we'll be here for 20 minutes watching this 10 times and I can't start it up. But <coughs> so. There's only one restriction. Um, so this is what we call left recursion. It's like f immediately calls f. Well, you'd wait a long time for that function f to return, right? Because it's like f immediately calls f. So it just makes no sense in our recursive descent world. But I do this weird like grammar transformation, and I can always get rid of left recursion. And it always uses a notion of precedence so that um, I can do things like expressions properly. It assumes that the alternative specified first has higher precedence. So multiply and divide have higher precedence than this one and so on. So it mimics this long chain of things. If you've done grammars before or hand-built parsers, you know there's this long chain of stuff. And the Java grammar, where did I go? I went from 172 lines to 91, and now all the expressions fit in one rule. So I mean, one It does not do indirect left recursion. That is the only caveat, and it is an engineering compromise. Because if I, if I can get away with that small caveat, then I go from like this horrible n cubed thing down to just quasi-linear. 
So this is, it was a good trade-off. And I, I look at this and I go, oh, you know, that smells very much like a left recursive rule. So as long as you follow this basic pattern that it's a binary operator, a ternary operator, a unary operator, or something else, uh, which more or less covers it, then I know how to do the rewrite automatically so that this becomes a, a standard grammar underneath the covers. And it uses predicates to check the precedence of the previous. Like if you've got 3 plus 4 times 5, you want the multiply to happen first, right? Well, the code I generate actually has predicates in there to check to see what the precedence of the current operator and the next operator are so that it does the right thing. Because this is a horribly ambiguous grammar, right? Because a little kid starts out, they say 3 plus 4 times 5. Why not do the plus first? Actually, I don't know why not, but, you know, that's the way we do it. Um, so this is a huge win. This is a much, much more natural way to do it. And the cool thing is also do the legere de main so that the, uh, the parse tree looks exactly like this would generate as opposed to something like this. And you know this, you, just to match an integer, you have to go down like 20 levels of precedence. You're making 20 function calls to match an integer. And guess what? You know, x equals 5, that's the most common expression you're going to see. So this will match it instantly. So it's bueno. Oh, that's it. So um, these grammars, you can give it pretty much whatever you want. Okay, you, there's a little bit of wrinkle with that recursion thingy, left recursion, but you can pretty much give it what you want. And it does full context, which is most likely meaningless, but normally parsers make a decision based on where am I and what are the next characters or next tokens. Antler 4 also can take into consideration the call stack of how you got there. So if I'm in a method declaration and I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to match a method body or just a semicolon, I can actually check the stack to see if I'm in an interface definition or a class definition. <laughs> right? So that is technically exponentially complex, but you know, engineering, you know, in the real world, most of the time it ain't. So, um, so that works out great. And so I automatically build trees for you. And I automatically generate the infrastructure so that it'll walk all that stuff. And since we've de-emphasized actions, you really can get a grammar that uh, you can reuse. I mean, it's sort of the holy grail, right? You don't have to go, oh, I found a yak grammar for uh, you know, Python, but it's got all these weird actions. I've got to cut those out, and oh, it's got all kinds of weird special case stuff. The grammar is now clean, okay? So we can generate in different languages and we reuse it for different applications. Even in the same application, you might have a Java grammar. In one case, it translates you know, for refactoring to get interfaces. Another, you might execute little bits of code, things like that. So all that can happen just from one grammar. And uh, then, of course, the shameless plug for the extremely expensive 20-something dollar book that all the cool kids are buying, as far as I understand it. <laughs> and uh, what else? That's it. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is less of a question, more of a tangent. Okay. Ah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what does star mean? What's that? What does star mean? Is it bold? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So, so that, that was the interesting thing. So, um, one of the things that I came up with, like, I only was ever, ever able to get, so it's like actual, like, a Wikimedia corpus, right? Um, and the definition of wiki text for Wikimedia corpus is what version of Wikimedia is installed at Wikipedia to get the corpus back, right? So, and, and it's, a, it's a ball of PHP. You're talking about wiki extractor.py? What's that? You're talking about the wiki extractor.py program? Or, uh, no, or this is all PHP. Oh, you did your own? Okay. Yeah, it's all, mm -hmm. it's all Wikimedia PHP stuff. The, the thing that I was working on was uh, maybe it's time. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's time on Google. <laughs> Like, so the, the, the interesting thing I found was that the, the recognition of a token 
is fully dependent upon the content. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, for instance, uh, you know, whether or not I should tokenize a, um, um, a quotation mark depends completely upon whatever token came before. And so I've actually put a stack inside of the tokenizer mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. in order to just give that context. So it's like, okay, the, my, my stack looks like this, therefore I can interpret this character as this token. Otherwise, I'm going to make Indeed it is. I can confirm that you are not crazy, sir. Okay. Um, at least in this area. I, I can't speak outside of this. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I'm doing some statistics now and I'm learning not to extrapolate. So. Uh, so what you've described is sort of modes, right? It's like XML, right? Are you in a tag or am I outside of a tag? So it's very similar to that, except it's more complicated because you can have nested, like the Wikipedia thing is like, it's got nested double brackets, it's got nested crap, right? And I'm unfortunately intimately familiar with this because literally just yesterday, I was working with some students doing a bunch of Wikipedia parsing. <laughs> and uh, there, there's actually, somebody actually built an Antler 3 grammar for it uh, that I started to look at and I'm like, you know what? This is just as bad as all those regular expressions. But um, the yes. new... <laughs> But, wait, there's something new. Uh, so in, it's not that it's my idea, but it, it's an old idea of this lex called modes. And you can define effectively sublexers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so what you do is if you're in the tag mode, you switch to a different mode and then all those rules apply only in that context. Right. But what you've done is to add a stack to that, which effectively gives you the power of a pushdown automata, which makes you as powerful as the parser. Correct. Yes, which is what you kind of need. Um, and so in, and there four, you can have these modes and you can say, you know, switch to mode inside tag, or you can say push mode. Yeah. And then later pop mode. Yep. <laughs> 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 yeah. All without special actions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to put special actions in that grammar. So yeah, I'm um, you know, and of course we got let's see. Oh. We can even do some really crazy fuzzy parsing. Like Ignore everything inside of a method, but mash the stuff outside. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be super fast, but you can do some really crazy fuzzy parsing with this non-greedy operator, because we even have the non-greedy operator in the parser. So you can match, you know, just scarf the entire center of a method or whatever if you want to ignore it. Anyway, so there's some fun stuff uh, in this new version, and I think I finally got it figured out. For most, for most cases, I think this is going to work out. What's this, it? Is it? this is it, man. I got, well, it better be because I can't do another V5. V5 I'm, I, I, I said that the, when I started version 4, I actually started fixing version 3 because I'm like, oh my God, this is a mess. And I can't leave a mess for people to carry on with. So I'll, I started kind of fixing it. And then I'm like, oh, you know, wouldn't it be interesting? And then all of a sudden this new adaptive LL star thing came around. Because then I was, what I really want to do is leave a parser generator where you can just give it whatever you want, more or less, and, um, and have it be fast enough and useful and all. So, oh man, so there's a couple other things I want to do, but I, I don't know if I got a stomach for it. We'll see. But I'm going to keep maintaining the code, and, uh, and uh, I'm doing an academic paper on the parsing algorithm. And then I got I to gotta get back to the 80s, <laughs> and back to uh, machine learning stuff. So, yeah. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? Could you talk briefly yep. about Mm -hmm. Like, is it a probabilistic method? No. It is always uh, deterministic and exact. It, imagine, okay, so everybody gets the decision issue, right? You're coming, it, the analogy is you come to a fork in a maze, and you've got three or four paths in front of you, and you've got to figure out which one leads you to the exit. So a maze is an amazing analogy to parsing. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> I got a few more of those, stick around. <laughs> yeah, those are gold, man, gold. Uh, <laughs> so imagine parsing analogous to a maze. You've got a passphrase written in your hand, and there are words on the floor of the maze. And the passphrase tells you, to, you match it up on the ground, and then it tells you which path to take, right? But what if you come to a maze, a fork, 
And the next word is like dog. But every pass starts with dog on it, right? <laughs> oh, now that's got me intrigued. <laughs> All right. You can tell me later. Okay, so what you need is, so the first symbol of look ahead, we would say, does not tell you which path to take. So then you turn up your flashlight and you go, oh, look at the second word ahead, and maybe that'll tell you. But ultimately, in the worst case, you might actually have to just send your kid brother running through the maze to the exit to see if it reaches the exit, right? So the concept is, let's just launch, every, for every alternative path, just launch a subparser, like in a thread or something, just launch it. And then eventually they'll come to a dead end and die off. And eventually a single path or a single thread will have reached the end and you know you have success. But of course that's pretty inefficient, right? Because what if you get 10 words ahead and everybody dies off but one alternative? Then you know which one to predict. Remember, we're not parsing, we're predicting. Because then we're going to resume the regular parse process and use the thing you can step through with the debugger, the normal parser. So the trick is to, in pseudo-parallelism, in lockstep, have all of these sub-parsers march ahead. And eventually they're all going to die except one. And ignore the case when there's more than one. And uh, so that's your prediction process. The alternative associated with the sub-parser that is the sole survivor. That is the prediction you make. Okay, so if you're at an expression and the only parser that survives is the one associated with a uh, function call, then you know that's the one to predict. Now, remember the fact that the last time you saw that exact sequence at that location with that exact call stack, because maybe you called from an assignment, which was called from a method, which was called from a class, you record all of that crap and you freeze dry it, and then the next time you come back, you say, oh, is it the same stack? Am I in the same spot? Do I have the same like ID, left parenthesis, ID, right parenthesis? I do, oh, I know what that answer is. So you just think of like a little map, right? I map input sequence to predicted alternative at every spot. And so the next time I come through, it's, it's a hash table lookup. I don't have to do these sub parsers. So you, you, kinda, you kinda take it in the shorts the first time you hit a decision, right? But then you record all of this information and then the next time you come back, it's really fast. And that's why it warms up. So it warms up like a just-in-time compiler. So you're caching all of the hard work into a data structure, and um, that's how you can get it to go fast in the, in the long term. Yeah. How big is yeah. Well, it could get exponentially big. <laughs> um, so it turns out you don't actually record the call stack, because that's one of your biggest offenders. Um, you only do that if you need to. So you actually, there's a hybrid approach. You start out, and the first thing you do is you do a quick L01 pass over the grammar statically. So when you actually generate the grammar, you go, which of these decisions require one symbol of look ahead? And then you just generate a switch for that in the generated code. So you don't even consider those in the analysis at runtime. And the vast majority of decisions are like L01, L02, or L03. Just a few symbols of look ahead will get you there. So most of the time I'm recording like little one and two and three token sequences. And I'm doing that in a DFA, so it's optimal in speed and compression, right? And I don't record the stack. However, if I find ambiguity, more than one subparser succeeds. I'm like, row, row. I don't know which to take. At this point, I don't know if it is a true ambiguity in your grammar or it's a weakness in the algorithm that does not consider the call stack. So at that point, I must fail over and restart with the full meal deal. And then I take into consider the call stack. And in my case, I actually, in my version of the, the algorithm, I do not actually record the call stack. So at that point, I would interpret it again the next time. But the cool thing is, is it's almost never the case that you need that. It's like a security blanket. If you need it, you got it. And in some cases, um, there, uh, well, okay, there's a lot of caveats. Uh, but in, in general, it's the case that I will never try to store exponentially large data structures. And uh, <laughs> so you can, you can rest assured that, you know, that's not going to be the problem. Um, Sam's algorithm 
it does something uh, really interesting. He basically, in the DFA, he doesn't say, okay, this stack, this input matches this prediction. He puts that stack onto the end of the DFA. So if you match ID, left parenthesis, ID, right parenthesis, he then says, oh, and then trace this. Is the stack expression statement class? So it hooks it into the DFA. And it turns out there's a lot of merging and stuff that goes on. Um, and uh, yeah, it can be done very efficiently. But that is really hard to read the code. <laughs> Uh, so, let's see, there's a complicated sequence of hybrids that are used to try the simplest possible algorithm that will work. And when that fails, I, I keep ratcheting up the sophistication until eventually um, I hit the maximum. And But at that point, and then you can also, okay, another caveat, but I ratchet it up to the full power of this thing. And I can always tell you whether it's an ambiguity. Uh, I never miss an ambiguity, right? So if, if you, like in C++, you know, T of I, it can mean like five different things. Um, so the parser will tell you that. Um, and it notifies a listener and you can ignore it if you want or whatever. So I've traded static grammar analysis where you get warnings. But now, you know, the other cool thing is with the other, you don't get any warnings at all, right? You run the grammar through it and it goes, okay. Um, and at runtime, if there is an ambiguity, it will notify a listener. So it's kind of like a static versus dynamically typed language. Um, but it turns out that the thing that I'm doing at runtime is undecidable beforehand. And so that's why this is much more powerful because I've shifted everything over. I literally take a copy of your grammar and I turn it into this internal uh, graph, uh, graph data structure, serialize it with your parser. And then I do grammar analysis on the fly. So, maybe any other quick questions we can get uh, can Dietrich up here? I, wanted, I was going to ask you to expand on the class point a little bit, but that's probably going to take a little too long. Okay, yeah, well, we can talk offline, but Dietrich, we should probably get you started. Oh, we should. Uh, I was, was going to ask oh, you. Oh, right, okay, um, go ahead. Uh, so, let's say you fire off multiple parsers. Uh -huh. um, what if they all fail? Like, how do you know which errors to actually ah. report back? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the simple answer, well, you go as high as you can, and then if you still get a, uh, an, you, if nobody succeeds, then you have a no viable alternative situation, and it's a syntax error. So the question is, you know, what do you tell the user? And I think, let's see, what do I do at the moment? I think I, I basically say, here's as far as I got in the furthest case. And I say, this is a syntax error. Um, in some cases, I can be smart, right? Because if I get eventually a syntax error, but I went through a bunch of rules successfully to get there, then I can be smarter and let it continue and then eventually fail closer to the error. And so, and yeah, the error handling is actually better in this version in a number of ways. Um, can you build up, excuse me, the implied tree before kind of building out the stack of one event? Right. In general, you would, um, you would want to have something on the front end that chunkified it, yeah. right? Like, line, like uh, for a protocol like you know, NNTP, FTP, uh, you know, all these things, they're all going to be like line based. So that's easy enough. You can break it at the line level. You can't always do that, and in which case, I couldn't build the tree for you. Yeah. But as long as you can give me a finite chunk, then, and usually that's the case. It's rare that you have to see all the way to the end of the universe to, um, you know, to really decide what the errors are. All right then. I guess we'll call it quits and uh, we can get uh, Dieter going. Thank you.